I probably just upset half the tarantula community saying that. So if I get canceled, it's been nice talking to you. I don't. <laughs> when we wake, hear the birds and see the sun. Side by side, our fears are done. All the good times just begun. You know, the idea of adding microfauna for like fossorial moisture dependent species, like um I'm trying to think of a good one. What's the what's the scientific name for, for cobalt blues now? Is it C lividum or lividus? I think oh gee, you asked me too, I think it's C lividus now. But like people want to add, you know, they want to add microfauna like springtails or whatnot to that type of setup which i, I guess could work but you know your, your tarantula isn't producing as much waste as as say a frog would because the, i mean these things they they poop a lot you know it's it's a fair amount of waste so your micro your, your cleanup crew really has its job cut out for itself you're going to want to provide enough of an area that think of it like a food pyramid i'm, I'm sorry if i'm going off on a tangent but you know you have an apex predator at the top say you know like a wolf you have herbivores you know Say it, say it takes 100 deer to keep one wolf alive over five years. Well, that 100 deer is going to say might need, you know, 10,000 acres to keep them alive. It's the same thing. You know, you're going to need enough space for your microfauna to survive and clean the tank effectively. So having a small bioactive, or you want to call it enclosure, isn't necessarily going to function, you know, unless you size the animal accordingly to it. So with tarantulas, it works great because they don't really produce much waste. I mean, yeah. I wipe the glass off of my, like my, 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 uh, my Armenia, I wipe the glass off maybe like once every six months. So it's really not a tremendous amount of waste. But with frogs, especially dwarf frogs, yeah, they can produce a lot of a lot of a lot of waste. So if you are going to keep them with what people would call bioactive, it, it makes life easier for you. You're not going to be changing substrate as often, and it's just going to be it's it's in this case it's better for the ant. I wouldn't use that line of keeping for other animals. I know people choose to do it, and I willingly do it for my frogs because that's what's best for them. But I don't do it with my arachnids because. I, number one, I don't keep moisture dependent species. Yeah. And if you dump a bunch of springtails into a dry enclosure, they're going to hang around the water pool until it evaporates and they're going to die. So it's, it's, it works in some situations and not in others. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go off topic. I could just, <laughs> I apologize. I'm, I'm not trying to be a, you know, like come off as arrogant or anything like that. It's just, we have, we have a different approach to it is all. And I, you know, yeah. apologize if I came off a tad harsh. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, it's it's definitely something that's worth discussing because, I mean, right now in the tarantula hobby, uh, everybody wants to keep everything bioactive because it looks cool. It makes it a lot more visually appealing to look into an enclosure that has live plants and is lit well and, you know, kind of has that whole ecosystem. But like you said, there's there's maybe like uh, I have some of my snakes are in bioactive, but they poop a lot and, you know, they, they shed and there's, you know, there's there's reasons for that. And, and I even have a few tarantulas and bioactive enclosures not because i want the cleaning crew so much it's more uh like theraphosa species they're they're very moisture dependent you know the older they get the larger they get the more important that is because uh they can have some serious issues molting if you know it's too dry in the enclosure so keeping that moisture in the substance like that can lead to you know just mushroom growth and, and things like that that are a pain to deal with so if i keep it bioactive for the most part the isopods and springtails clean all that up so I don't have to worry about mushrooms and mold. But when you got people trying to keep a fauna penguin at Calcodes or green bottle blues or, you know, like these arid species in a bioactive, it's like they don't need it. Like, it, it I understand that the desire to want to have a bioactive, but for, I mean, first and foremost, the tarantulas are nocturnal. They, they don't, they're very photosensitive. So if you got a bright light shining in that enclosure for 10, 12 hours a day, yes. you're not going to see that tarantula more than likely during those 10 or 12 hours. Like, it's going to stress them out and they're going to burrow and hide from that and come on out only at night you know where if you keep them in just like the ambient room lighting you, you know you're gonna have a much better a much better chance and actually there's been at least two people that have been on the podcast that have credited the dart frog hobby like that that community for for bringing bioactive setups to a lot of other hobbies like uh i, I think it was rust from aquarimax the first one that mentioned dart frogs because he was like he had never considered or knew he didn't know how to keep any amphibians or reptiles or anything bioactively until he started researching dart frogs and got into that whole hobby. And then they were the ones that were like the leaders in, in bioactive enclosures. Well, I mean, I always, sorry, my, my dog is like right here and he's like, he's like <laughs> breathing into the microphone. <laughs> I'm sorry if it's sissy here grunting. Um, I just assumed that was you. Yeah. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, I think that, you know, there's a distinction between what you would, I guess, consider a naturalistic vivarium 
and what people would consider a bioactive vivarium. Now, a naturalistic vivarium is essentially you want to recreate a biome. And that, the biome is, that's big with like uh, aquarists. A good example is a black water tank. Like if you keep a Amazon species, and I'm not an aquarist, so if I'm wrong, anyone out there, please correct me. But yeah. uh, you'll have a certain biome that you want to duplicate that animal's natural environment as closely as possible. And I'm not opposed to people recreating an animal's natural environment by any means at all. I think that that's a great thing. But, you know, like when it's done appropriately. So, I mean, bear in mind, there are people out there who do some really spectacular vivarium builds. They have some really great insights in terms of plants and whatnot. But the, the I guess you could say the gold standard for what people would consider bioactive is based on the dark frog setup. Now, the interesting thing about that is that's not necessarily appropriate to every situation. Now, let's think about the components that go into the average vivarium build for a dart frog and what people kind of consider as a template for a bioactive enclosure. All right, well, you've got a drainage layer, you've got some kind of a substrate barrier, and then you've got a substrate, and then generally some sort of hardscape. You've got microfauna in there, you know, kind of assist as a cleanup crew. Well, the drainage layer for dart frogs actually serves a very different purpose, you know, from what you'd think. Like I said, they don't remember how for a while people thought that certain species of tarantula had to be kept a certain way because they were from a certain place, meaning um, like a vicularia. They, they people kept them in these like stifling conditions and they didn't do particularly well because that wasn't actually what it was like. With dart frogs, you don't want their substrate to be soaking wet you want areas that are moist that they can go to but you don't want them walking around in the swamp so that drainage layer basically serves as that for a drainage layer but that's also contingent upon your substrate now if you're just putting topsoil on that or cocoa or uh eco worth of cocoa fiber that's going to maintain a lot of that moisture and that's not going to make its way through that substrate barrier into that drainage layer so you have to choose your substrate accordingly so a lot of us use what they call ABG mix, which was developed by the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. It's essentially a combination of like sphagnum moss, uh, some pea products, tree fern fiber, and uh, charcoal. So what happens is the substrate, it drains very, very easily down into the drains layer, which acts as a reservoir to maintain that, you know, maintain that humidity once it comes back. So I think what a lot of people kind of have the misconception is that, you know, if you're going to create what you would consider a bioactive enclosure for a different species, that you need all those elements. I mean, I've seen people use drainage layers for fossorial species of tarantulas. And I just think to myself, now you're inhibiting that animal's ability to engage its natural behavior. And that was your intention in the beginning was to create an environment where it could behave as naturally as possible. But now you're eliminating its ability to burrow by putting, you know, a layer of leeka, clay balls or whatever down below, which we don't serve the practical purpose because you don't want to flood this things burrow anyway i see no harm in providing a naturalistic a naturalistic environment for animals but i just don't think that the principles established by the dark frogs community are applicable to every situation i think that's the big misnomer that's out there is that people associate that 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 buzzword with a certain matter of keeping which is not necessarily appropriate for every species so you can't apply a one-size-fits-all situation to every you know to every case but i'm, I'm fairly active on, on uh, uh, arachnoboards actually and there's actually a lot of you know froggers who keep tarantulas and there's, there's a couple of us out there and this is one person i can't remember this person's name but i don't even know if it's he or she but this person's got a really great natural set naturalistic setup for um, an age niculata and this setup is choice it's perfect but it was well thought out and well planned ah oh, man i can't remember this person i don't want to call anybody out by name but that's an example of when you can pull it off like with an aeginiculata you can pull it off but with another species like you said um like like gbbs you know um you can't pull that off because it's not going to accomplish the intended purpose so you're not serving that animal's needs by trying to fit it into a template just because you think that that's where it goes you know i mean when it comes to i guess technically bioactive enclosures uh for tarantulas the only ones that i have I guess, like i said for my theraphosa species and that's more of an experiment than anything i'm just seeing how well this works uh and then i just did a uh, a paludarium a bioactive setup for a carabina versicolor because they do like you know it's got good airflow but it also has good humidity um, but even when I, I did that and I, and I made a video on it, I was sure to like, and I actually I just released another video setting up another enclosure for a Caribbean versicolor. or just be like, they don't need bioactive. Like that, that is not, I am in no way trying to stay, say this is the standard of keeping them because I don't even know if it's going to do well. This is a, an experiment, you know, because it's like, it could do really well being in that type of environment or, you know, it's a lot more work definitely than just keeping it in a acrylic enclosure 
with substrate a large water dish and some fake plants just for looks like that's much easier to do it's just as happy uh, and i think uh, at least in the tarantula hobby a lot of people get caught up in doing the bioactives just because it, it looks cool or it makes them seem more experienced they're, they're see, like it's just something people can hang their hat on like well i keep all my tarantulas bioactive and it's like you think that makes you sound cool but that it's actually uh, kind of like waving a flag like i don't know what i'm doing because <laughs> it's like they don't need it they you know a lot of these are desert species or they're in, they're in scrublands and you know, they're not going to benefit from a high humidity damp environment that the plants are going to need you know uh not to mention the lights i mean it is fun i understand that aspect but i get so much hell from people that i don't even know who they are like just random people that leave comments on on posts and videos that are they hate plastic plants and they're like quit using plastic plants and i'm like no <laughs> like I, I like the way they look I mean, some of them are pretty cheesy looking, but I don't think the tarantula knows the difference really between a live plant or it's just something for them to, to use as a web anchor, you know, like it, it, I don't think they care. It's not worth all the extra effort to keep a live plant growing. Like the reason I got into tarantulas instead of reptiles or amphibians is because the low maintenance, just the husbandry of them is, is inexpensive and not time consuming. So when you get into bioactives, like it's, it's getting expensive and time consuming very quickly. I probably just upset half the tarantula community saying that so if i get canceled it's been nice talking to you i don't <laughs> I, I buried you if i was recommending somebody to get into tarantulas i would recommend you know like tom moran and your channel is really good too so thank you have i kissed your ass enough yet <laughs> <laughs>